Obadiah, the hardest book in the Bible to find. Obadiah. Who's the old preacher that said, turn to the clean part of your Bible? I can't remember who that is. Lee Robertson or one of those guys. I hope it's not too clean in the Minor Prophets uh, after this lesson especially. Minor Prophets are full of prophecies, wouldn't you know, about the Second Advent. And what happens at the Second Advent? Well, if you don't read the prophets, you're not going to know. And I think a lot of people neglect their Old Testament studies. I think uh, teachers are guilty of that. I think scholars are guilty of that. I think uh, average church people are guilty of that. And you get to these Old Testament prophets, and you're like, man, these books are short. I'm just going to get through them quick and finish up my Old Testament. And I've uh, this last year, I decided I'm not going to try to read through my Bible in a year. That was last year, so I didn't make it. And I just reread the same thing until I kind of get a hold of it. And then I'll move the bookmarker if I feel like it. And I'm, I'm not a stickler for you have to do this many pages. You've never heard me put anybody on a guilt trip for how many pages or chapters to read a day. Uh, we do have some, some more up here if you need a, an idea and you want to follow that. And I told you this uh, next time I'll come through and, and read the, the Bible in chronological order. That's my plan. <clears throat> but that's going to be a couple couple months. So in the minor prophets, don't rush through them. And hopefully you get some notes here that help you uh, get a little light on it in these lessons. Somebody said this, uh, an old minister, uh, Everett Harris, said this. He said, no one ever graduates from Bible study until he meets the author face to face. And you have a book in your lap that is unexhaustible. So I'll give you some things here, but don't think that the Lord only gives me stuff. The Lord will give you stuff and show you things daily, daily, day by day. And I believe that as we get closer to the time of the end, that there's going to be more light shed on the scriptures as we continue. One of the most foolish things you could hear a preacher say is, nobody believed that before the 1800s, therefore it's a suspect doctrine. That's a completely backwards. The Lord told Daniel these things are sealed up till the time of the end. There's some things that won't be revealed that haven't been revealed yet until that point in time at the end that the Lord determined for those things in Daniel, specifically those 1260, 1290, and 1335, and 2300 days. Those things aren't going to be fully revealed until the time of the end. So a lot of people have a lot of questions about those because of that very reason. So don't stop studying your Bible and don't get discouraged. The Lord has a, a way of shining the light on it when you need it the most. Look at Obadiah. We'll get through. I'm really hoping to get through five of these minor prophets tonight. We'll see how we do. I really want to get to Habakkuk and try to tie it together. But let's start in Obadiah, see how far we get. Try not to lose your attention here. Obadiah, and I always like to mention verse 4 when we come to Obadiah. This is one of the verses I saw back when I was in high school. And I, I, uh, <clears throat> everybody has an interest in NASA when you're in high school and elementary school. They get the solar system on every wall. You can't go anywhere without seeing the solar system. And again, I have some thoughts on that, but I try not to be too critical. Uh, Michael Jordan and the solar system. A fool's eyes are in the ends of the earth, right? How many of you are ever going to get up to, up to the space station, right? How practical is that, <laughs> right? You, anybody can be an astronaut. You can be the president. No, no, you can't. You're not smart enough. Just We knew that in third grade. There's no reason that anybody should have told you that. Um, uh, anyhow. Uh, this interested me because of all the all the uh, astronaut images and me getting to go to the, never mind, the, air, the thing in Ohio. Uh, verse 4, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, the eagle. What did they say when they got to the moon and they dropped down that little cart that they drove around like a dune buggy? What did they say over the radio? The eagle has landed. Now, where did they get that idea to call it an eagle? I suppose it's because it's America's bird and it's America's symbol. I suppose that's why they chose it. It's interesting in Obadiah 1.4, Though thou exalt thyself among the eagle, and the context is stars. Though thou set thy nest, like an eagle has a nest, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Now, do you notice how carefully that's phrased? It doesn't say that you can go up to the stars. It says, if you could go up to the stars, I'd knock you right back down. Though thou set thy nest. If you do it, I'll knock you back down. 
And I always thought reading this verse until this week, <laughs> I thought reading this verse that, yeah, we made it up to the moon, right? And we set our nest among the stars and then the Lord brought everybody back down. But <clears throat> do you realize that no human being has ever left our solar system? You ever think of that? I mean, they've got that pioneer thing that made it out past Pluto and now they lost radio signal with it back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, you've got you've got some uh, people trying to get to Mars now. Do you realize if we get people on Mars, we're still 4.24 light years away from the closest star because the Earth is also the same distance from the closest star, 4.24 to 4.37 light years away. The star is called Alpha Centauri. It's actually three stars clustered together. You can't really tell that until you zoom it way in with a big old telescope. It's Alpha Centauri A and B, 4.37 light years away. And Alpha Centauri C, which is slightly closer, 4.24 light years away. They're all locked together gravitationally, they say. So they all look like one star and they kind of hang out together. Now, if I did the math right, <coughs> and you could travel at uh, 35,000 miles per hour, it would take you approximately 168,000 years to reach that. That's just traveling at the speed of a space shuttle in, in the atmosphere. If you want to do the math on your own, just take the light years and divide that by years and then divide or, or multiply that um, by 365, 186,000 miles, not, not the years I just said, but miles per second is the speed of light, 186,000, times 365, times 24, times 60, times 60, right? And then divide that by your miles per hour. I believe I did the math right. It's going to take you, uh, oh, what is that, 1,680 lifetimes if you could live to 100. Though thou set thy nest among the stars... You haven't developed a warp drive yet. You know where setting your nest among the stars? It's in science fiction. <laughs> you haven't figured out the tachyon beam yet for all the Star Trek nerds. It hasn't happened yet. It's not very likely to happen. If you could, I'd bring you down. And the whole theme of this verse is that you don't belong there. You don't have a body made for that. This universe is incredibly vast. I just found out this week, I've been reading a little bit about this, um, that the... All the stars that you can see with your eyeball are all contained in one of the spiral arms, the one you're located in, in the Milky Way galaxy that you're a part of. People say, we're looking at the Milky Way. Well, kind of not, not really. <laughs> you're in the Milky Way. So you're in a spiral arm of the Milky Way where you can't see any other stars in any of the other spiral arms. And now with the newest, I mean, with, with Hubble, we knew there was millions and billions of galaxies and trillions, and each of those have millions and billions of stars. <coughs> That's something, isn't it? Just if you needed to feel a little humiliated today in your, your power and uh, your position and your influence in the universe, it's very minuscule. And the Lord still wants to talk to you. How sweet it is to spend uh, uh, just an hour in time and talking to the Lord. We're talking about prophecy here. Look at Obadiah 17, verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. They don't possess their possessions today. But in this time, they will. Verse 18, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph. So now there's a distinction between Jacob, that's the tribes of Judah, and Joseph, that's the tribes of Israel. House of Joseph shall be a flame, so, so both of them are going to be on fire. And the house of Esau for stubble. So Esau gets destroyed. They shall kindle in them and devour them. There shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. So Obadiah is a prophecy against Edom, or Esau, and the place is going to be destroyed with fire. That's kind of the theme of what we're looking at. Look at verse 15. Here's our context. 
For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. The Lord's going to come back with some judgment on all the nations that caused trouble for the Israel in the past. Okay, turn to Jonah. Turn to Jonah. <clears throat> Now, Jonah's prophecy seems to be a little more closer reaching. Look in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before the, uh, me. Now what is Nineveh the capital of? Anybody remember? Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and Assyria plays a major role in the second advent. Keep in mind the second advent, maybe I should mention this just so you know where we're at. Mm, let's start with the cross here and go through. That's not going to carry us very far. A little, a little better. Okay. So, got a rapture, tribulation, and then you have the millennium, and then you have a final judgment. Let's, uh, Let's just draw a bar here. Okay. There's a judgment seat of Christ at the rapture. There's a return of Christ with his saints. And there is a second judgment. This would be the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. You know, both judgments, people's works are judged. Isn't that what a judge is for? To judge your works. At this one, though, it's Christians' works being judged to see how they get rewarded. At this one, every man, I saw the dead, small, and great sin before God and the dead were uh, judged. Every man according to his works, except he's judged for his works to determine his eternal condition, whether he gets cast in the lake of fire or whether he continues with the Lord. So you, you know the judgments are different. Anyhow, this is the rapture, and we tend to call this the second coming, although that won't come through on every single verse. And we call this the second advent. And the distinction that we make is an advent, is the second advent, is because the first advent, Jesus' feet were on the earth. He's born as a baby, and he's walking around in Jerusalem and Galilee and Israel. This place here, Jesus' feet land on the earth, and that distinguishes it from the rapture. That's one major distinction that you see in between Matthew 24 and then, obviously, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> okay? So when we're talking about the second advent and all this fire and all this destruction, it's all happening. Let's let's uh, use a different color. It's all happening. Let's see that one. Here at the end of the tribulation and then on into the millennium for a little time. And then there's a cleanup period here, and we've not quite ready to cover all those verses, but we'll get, we'll get into the details of the chronology here in about three weeks, give or take. That's my guess. Okay, now Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and Assyria has some connection with the Antichrist. I don't know how to tie in every detail about the Antichrist. He has a connection in the Bible with the tribe of Dan. Dan's got something bad going on, something wrong with Dan. He doesn't show up in the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation listed among the tribes. He has a very strange prophecy given about him in Genesis 49. Something corrupt happens in Dan. So the Antichrist may have a connection to the Jewish lineage through Dan, possibly. Um, he may have a connection to Edom. There's certainly a number of things against Edom and Esau in the Bible. He definitely has a connection to Assyria. He's called the Assyrian many times. But you know that somebody can be called oh, uh, the Syrophoenician woman, right? And then called the Canaanite, and then it's the same woman because her lineage is here and her genealogy is here and then her home is here, and you can be called... I mean, people ask me where I'm from, and I said today, uh, I, I, I came from Alaska. That's just my shortest answer. And it kind of trumps everything. You don't want to say you're from Florida. If you're in Montana, you, you gotta, guys got to find a different answer because, like, oh, yeah, the slow south or whatever they think of Florida. you got to tell, tell people Missoula. Like, just hold fast to that. Don't dig into the details. I tell people I'm from Alaska, and they say, oh, yeah, okay, well, how'd you end up in Montana? Well, then I got to back up and tell the whole story. Uh, Bible school and calling and all that in Ohio has to sometimes even get mentioned. So, 
This, uh, this man has a connection to probably the Canaanites. I can't prove that for sure. Assyrian, for sure. Edomite, for sure. The Catholic Church, for sure. The Muslims, probably. Like, he has all these factors, and it may involve marriages. It may involve other, other um, religious aspects of it and family aspects. <clears throat> so Jonah is a prophet against Nineveh, which is Assyria. Now look at what he says in chapter 4. Jonah 4, Jonah gets very upset at the Lord, and, and you have to understand why he's upset. He didn't want to go and prophesy against this place. And you're like, Jonah, what's your problem? You're just having a bad day? You're just mad at the Lord? You're having like an Apostle Peter moment? What's your deal? And the real deal with Jonah is that he knows how God's mercy works, and if God has mercy with these Ninevites, the Ninevites are Israel's enemy. He wants, it's in Jonah's best interest, and in Israel's best interest, for Nineveh to stay on in their Baalite worship corruption so that God knocks them off the map. That's really their best desire, and that, that is uh, portrayed really well in The Chosen. Have you guys been keeping up with The Chosen? It's pretty good stuff. I, they miss a few things here and there, and I have some minor critiques. But boy, they sure do have that thing nailed down when Jesus stands in the temple and reads the half of a verse of scripture. Can you guys see that yet? That's excellent. And all his buddies that see him not being able to be super coordinated and play handball, they're playing a little game and Jesus misses a couple times. <laughs> they're just setting the whole thing up. And then he stands in the temple and reads half a verse out of Isaiah and he doesn't read and the day of the vengeance of our God and they get upset at him and then they realize he's calling himself the Messiah. And then they take him to the brow of the hill to push him off the hill and stone him. And he walks through their midst. It's, it's portrayed differently than I would have done it, but very well. I thought it was very well portrayed. You know what the Lord does? The Lord has mercy on people. And then the enemies are strengthened, and the Jewish people want nothing but vengeance. How can you have minor prophet after minor prophet after minor prophet prophesying the fire and destruction and wrath of God coming on your enemies and then be looking for that and then Jesus shows up as the Messiah and he's not a military politician leader that's rallying millions of people to follow him and destroy Rome. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. Verse 4, uh, Jonah chapter 4 rather, verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly as it would any Jew who's in this position. He was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Didn't I tell you, God, you're going to be merciful and you're going to spare these people? That's why I didn't want to go. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth thee of the evil. And can I add one more thing here? <laughs> and you made me look like a false prophet, God. I said Nineveh is going to get destroyed, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Was it overthrown in 40 days? <laughs> Jonah, you're a false prophet, prophesying directly what God told you to prophesy. Now we realize in the statement that it's conditional, right? Yet 40 days, there's a condition, it'll be overthrown. So obviously don't get overthrown, repent. So it was a conditional statement. But verse 3, Jonah's pretty upset. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You know, most problems people have with the Lord is that their expectations were not turning out the way that they had planned. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. You have it set out like it's going to go like this because you know how things go because of your past experience. And you ought to listen to the radio ads that say past performance is no guarantee of future results. You know, well, clippy zip it at the end <laughs> they say it about three times faster you don't know what's going to happen in the future you're really poor at prophecy so Jonah's a little upset at the Lord and the Lord has a discussion with him we'll maybe preach that another time turn to Micah and let's look at this country of Assyria next book Micah you know that the Lord preserves Nineveh because they followed the preaching of Jonah So Jonah is temporarily a false prophet. Micah 5 and verse 5. Micah 5, 5. And this man shall be the peace 
And I believe that's Jesus Christ. If you underline this man, that's going to be Jesus. And then the next line, when the Assyrian shall come into our land, that's going to match the Antichrist. And you have to read the context here to, to verify that, but you check that out on your own. We don't have time to give the whole chapter here. When the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he, that's the Assyrian, shall tread in our palaces, then shall we rise, uh, raise against him, against the Antichrist, the Assyrian, seven shepherds and eight principal men. I'm going to try to save some time here. Write down Isaiah 31, 4 through 9. Isaiah 31, 4 through 9, and, and study those verses on your own time. You'll find the Assyrian there, I believe, a few verses past verse 9. But you'll find the same thing with the shepherds showing up and holding off the Assyrian. Look in verse 6 here, Micah 5, 6. They shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof. Thus shall we, he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst, that's a good phrase to study, in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord. There's always a remnant. They're compared to dew. They're compared to lilies. There's something very fragile, but the Lord preserves a few of them. As the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. One more verse. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Skip down to verse 15. And I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Now, if you keep in the side list, there's one to add to the references that none shall be like it before or ever to many generations. Remember that reference? Here's another one. The fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. This has never happened before. Now, if that prophecy was already fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, then there's never going to be another destruction like it. The Holocaust was far, far worse than the destruction of AD 70. World War I was far worse than that. World War II was far worse than that. Uh, Vietnam was far worse than that. Uh, so those destructions are still up and coming on your calendar if you take the scriptures literal. If you don't take them literal, then rewrite the Bible. I don't know what to tell you. Go to Nahum. Jonah, Mike, and Nahum. Nahum is the book against Nineveh. And you could write that as a heading, or you could just circle the fourth word in the book. Sometimes the beginning of the book is a title to the book, The Burden of Nineveh. So this is going to be the Lord's con condemnation against Nineveh. And Nineveh doesn't last forever. Nineveh does get destroyed. Look in verse um, 3. Nahum 1, 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath, in, uh, hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry. And drieth up all the rivers. That's what Elijah did when the fire came out of heaven and dried up all the water. That's a cross reference. Bashan languisheth and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Everything's getting burned up. The mountains quake at him. That's an earthquake, or at least a mountain quake. And the hills melt. Well, the rocks are getting so hot they're melting. That sounds like a volcano to me. The earth is burned at his presence. You can't just say it's all volcanoes. It's the Lord being there. Here's the fire coming out ahead of him again. The earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Look down in verse, well, so let's read 6 and then we'll skip down. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. It does sound a lot like a volcano to me. Look in verse uh, 15. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. 
O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. He is a person. It's going to be the Antichrist again. Look in chapter 2. We'll look at a couple more here in Nahum. Nahum 2, 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition. That's where we get the word ammunition. Munition is anything serving as a defense or protection. So it's interesting. The word ammunition is for defense. Watch the way. Make the loin, thy loins strong. Fortify thy power mightily. Get ready to go to battle. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Israel's in a bad state here. They're getting attacked. Verse 3, the shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. It looks like the Antichrist is showing up here with a bunch of vehicles. And these vehicles, according to Nahum, seeing ahead in the future, look like a bunch of chariots that have fire on them and they're running so fast that you can't really tell what's going on. The fir trees terribly shaken. Now look at verse 4. The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. Now, every time I read that verse, I think of that long exposure picture they take over a freeway sometimes. And you see the clover leaf and all the, they take it at night and all you see is the headlights, you know, stretched out for, for miles and every, there's thousands of cars there. They shall run like lightning. So, Nahum's seeing ahead here, and he's saying, man, these things aren't like horses pulling chariots, but they look like chariots, and I don't have another word for it. And you do see the word car in chariot, right? You see that? In the book of Acts, it says they picked up their carriages. And you're like, they picked up their carriage. And, like, <laughs> and they're talking about their suitcases. A carriage is for carrying things, right? And the chariot is where we get our word car from. And those chariots are raging in the street. They're flying around so fast, Nahum doesn't even know what he's looking at. And he might be looking at tanks or missiles. He might be looking at helicopters. Who knows? But he's looking at something looks like on the ground and then driving up around on the walls. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, he shall recount his worthies. <clears throat> now look at this here. They shall stumble in their walk. Now you know that's not us because we just covered that last week that nobody's going to break ranks. Remember all that? So this is the Antichrist again. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defenses shall be prepared. Uh, let's not read the whole thing, but look at verse 10. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, the knees smite together. There's somebody's knees knocking together. That comes from the Bible. Much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. Cross-reference, Joel 2.6. Exact same thing. Verse 11. Where is the dwelling of the lions in the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion, walked, and the lion's whelp, and none made them afraid. The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lioness. Strange stuff. I don't have all this figured out. And filled his holes with prey, and the dens with raven, like, like uh, spoils. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. Remember it says Dan shall be like a, a young lion and like an adder in the way, and he'll bite at the horse's heels. So there's another connection to Dan. Okay, but the Lord's coming back with some fire, and he's going to destroy it. But it doesn't mean the Antichrist or the beast or the whole thing, however that works, isn't going to get a foothold first. Look in Nahum 3, two more verses here. Nahum 3. And verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound, thy wound is grievous. Uh, what's my cross reference here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good crosser. Just write down Revelation 16, 2. And the first went and poured out his vial on the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which have the mark of the beast. So there's the connection to the mark of the beast. Oh, what's that one? Like a 1 9. Her wound is incurable. 
for it has come unto Judah, and he he has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. That's connected with graven images, the harlot, all that's connected to the the whore of Revelation 17, the image in Revelation 13. Okay, last verse in Nahum 319. There is no healing of thy bruise, thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of thee. What's bruit mean? I, I don't have it written down here. Hmm? A rumor? Okay. Shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hast not thy wickedness passed continually. So Nineveh does get destroyed. Back in back in the pre back in the Old Testament days. But this prophecy is going to happen again in the future. Um, let's look at one more. We made it to Habakkuk. Good. Habakkuk 3. Now, Joel 2 might be my favorite, but it's a close tie between Habakkuk 3 and Joel 2. Habakkuk 3, a prayer of Habakkuk. The prophet of something I can't pronounce. Verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Habakkuk 3, 2. O Lord, revive thy work. Here's that word midst again. It's a good study. Remember where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Jesus was crucified between two thieves in the midst. All right. Jesus was out on the sea. And when Jesus came to the midst of the sea, He's always showing up in the midst. So here's the midst of years, a little different context. And in the midst of years is probably going to put it in the middle of seven years. Uh, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, just so you saw that it was important. Make known in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman. Now Teman is down there right below the Dead Sea. Remember the Jordan River comes down, the Dead Sea Edom is in that area. Teman is in Edom, just south of the Dead Sea. And the Holy One from Paran, that's right next door, southwest of the, of the Dead Sea. So God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. Now you're going to read these next things and think all this takes place on the earth, but you were just told in verse uh, three, that this is not just on earth, this is heavens and earth. Okay, now let's get, now that we got our context, let's see what we're looking for. Four, and his brightness was as the light. So it's like a atom bomb going off in the distance. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. That's the best verse in the Bible on horns connected with power. That's one of those good references to scribble in the front of your Bible. Sometimes you read horns and the goat had a horn and Daniel, like, what is he talking about? It's a symbol of him having power and preeminence. Horns, mountains are both connected with power, and it, and it is symbolic. Or he literally had horns in his hand. I don't know. That might be literal. But it tells you it was the hiding of his power. Verse 5, before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. You find that in Ezekiel's wheel. You find that in Revelation 1. Verse 6, he stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow or bow. His ways are everlasting. Now, how many times have we read the mountains melted or the mountains were leveled or the mountains here are scattered? So whatever's happening in these earthquakes, I have a, I have a theory, I can't completely prove this, but it looks like before the flood, the earth didn't have these ginormous mountains everywhere. And it looks to me in the Bible like mountains are a result of judgment. So they picture power, like I mentioned, but they picture upheaval and something being destroyed and something really going to pot and falling apart. So however that water got to the earth, which if you believe Kent Hovind's blasted out of the center of the earth thing, help yourself, I don't think that fits everything. Looks like that water came from outside of the atmosphere of our earth and God applied it to the earth. And that drove deep trenches everywhere, which we have as oceans now, but also all that force upheavaled and pushed up the mountains. And as a result of judgment, the mountains are there today. Okay, And then I don't know how much water was on the earth, if it had to be enough to cover Mount Everest today or if it was enough water to cover the mountains that were then. So it may have been, may have been less water than... I mean, if it covered Mount Everest, where did it all go? 
You ever think of that? Anybody ever think of that? There's not enough room for it to all go anywhere because it would still be covered. So it may have covered lower mountains that were there or, or whatever. And then that upheaval got shoved up because of the mountain. I'm not trying to, some of you are looking at me cross-eyed like, are you not believing the Bible? It covered the highest mountains that were there. That's what I believe. It just doesn't tell you that there was 27,000 feet elevation mountains on the earth in that day. And then all that water, I believe, is still here, and it fills the oceans today. So there's much less water, and there's a mist water in the ground, and the, and the, the aquifers worked differently back then. However they worked, they, they evenly watered everything somehow in the gardens from, a, uh, what does it say, a, not a dew, but from a, a mist that came up out of the ground. It's kind of like automatic sprinkler systems, but you never had to dig and put pipes in, and they never froze. Like, however that worked, it's not like it is today. Okay, sorry. I do believe the Bible. I really, really, really believe the Bible. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, please. That's a theory, yes. Right. So that's a, a theory, and I'm not smart enough to disprove it. I just don't like it. So let's do this. Okay, so here's here's the earth. I'll show you these pieces here that, that is proposed. So this is uh, all water in here. This is unknown here by their theory. There's no question that it's hell, okay? Molten core, whatever. It's, it's hollow. It's hell. It's a compartment. But on their theory, it's a question mark, okay? So let's be consistent to their theory. And then do I have a... The right color, and then this is the f the the ground everywhere. Right. I'm not going by Kent Holden. I'm going by what the Bible says. The fountains of the deep. Okay, this isn't a bad theory. It just doesn't match Genesis one and two very well. So let's let's run it all the way out. So God broke up the fountains of the deep. So let's say this is the fountains of the deep, and then God starts cracking and shaking stuff, and there's fissures here, right? And so this thing opens up, and this thing opens up, and what's gravity going to do? It's going to pull this down, right? And all the way around the Earth. So then when that is torn up, then these fountains, if this is the deep, which is how Henry Morris teaches it, uh, Kent Hovind and others, then these fountains go up, and they shoot up into the stratosphere and beyond, and then the water comes back down, okay? Stat, stat, strat. Thank you, teenagers. So then all these fountains are broken up and they're spewing stuff everywhere, okay? All the way around the earth. And they go up into the stratosphere and then they come back down and instantly freeze the woolly mammoths, which is a good theory because the woolly mammoths are instantly frozen, right? Do you guys all, everybody know that? Boy, mammoths are instantly frozen, and they have food in their stomachs that's undigested in their mouth. And then people found them frozen, hacked them up, and fed the f food to their dogs like that was undigested, and the woolly mammoths themselves. Okay, so that's a theory. <coughs> I have a little different theory. This is the universe. All the scientists, they get a little closer to it every year. Anybody seen the pictures online of the universe that looks like this? And they say this is the Big Bang. This is 13.8 million years. And they kind of have it figured out partly. And then this was like the s couple seconds after the big, or microseconds. And then, and then oh, it's, here we are today, like, like a whole new world. This is where we live like today. And everything's just these spiral arm galaxies that we don't know how they got there because they're that old and it supposedly takes a billion years to form them, but they're 13.4 billion years old. So the whole thing doesn't add up. That doesn't work. But this works in the Bible. If this is the earth, and this is the firmament here, according to Genesis 1, and this is the firmament, according to Genesis 1. The firmament is where the birds fly. Check Genesis 1. The firmament is where the stars are. Check Genesis 1. Okay, in Psalm 136, 
we don't have time for all this. You have to look it up. I've taught on this before. In Psalm 130, no, yeah, I think, 1048, I believe. It says, the waters which are above the heavens. And in one of those passages, it says, the waters which were below the heavens. Now, you can't have water above two heavens unless it's above this second heaven. This is called the second heaven because Paul called this the third heaven in something, Corinthians something. Second Corinthians. It's caught me off guard. Second Corinthians 14 is what I want to say. I'm second guessing. That. Nope. 12. Second Corinthians 12. Paul called this the third heaven that gives you two more to figure out. Not hard to figure out. He made the stars also, and the stars are in the firmament. And then this is also called the firmament. Now, if the great fountains of the deep broke up, it says God opened the windows of heaven. Now, these are some windows in heaven, and these are some windows in heaven. And there's water up there, and there's no question. There's no question that there's water all over. There was water all over the universe. Uh, this week I was reading up some things about Mars. It looks like, one second, it looks like there was floods of water on Mars that were... I don't remember the numbers, thousands of times more than the amount that comes out of the Amazon River every year coming through places on Mars that there's no other way to explain it. It was just, it's, it's water damage, the way it came over. There's water, evidence of previous water all over the, the solar system that we, can, that we can see. And then, of course, they're always reflecting, finding evidence of ice and ice crystals and billions of gallons, and I have that in my files in the office. He opened up the, yeah, comets are full of ice, yeah. So, so there's windows of heaven. And here's what I believe, and this is what I have 50 scriptures to teach on it, is that the fountains of water came from here, from these stores of water, and the face of the deep is frozen. Okay, not the movie. And this water came from here to here. And if you've heard this talk a couple times, you start asking, well, how did the water get from here to here? Did it, like, travel in a, like, God's squirt gun, like, shot it through the stars, and it's, like, taking its court? Or it probably, how did it come to here? It came through the clouds. And the reason I think that fits is because every time the Lord shows up, behold, he cometh with, he always shows up in clouds. He comes in a chariot, and it said he maketh the clouds his chariot. And when Ezekiel sees him in that picture, he sees him in a cloud with sapphire below him and <clears throat> sapphire above him, I believe, as well. And his feet are as burnished brass. And he's in this contraption, Ezekiel's wheels, called a chariot. So that water got from there to there, how to get there. It got there the same way the Lord gets here. It got there the way, same way that we go to heaven. We shall meet each uh, We shall meet in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, right? Where do we go from the clouds? The clouds is how you transport from heaven to earth. Elijah was taken up in a fiery chariot in a what? A whirlwind. It's also part of the weather, okay? So I'm pretty sure the water was added to the earth, and we just got to keep it, and Mars didn't get to keep it for whatever reason. There's a lot of water all out there destroying a bunch of things. Now, I'm glad you asked that because this is going to fit everything I said here. And I, I wasn't going to take the time, but now you got that picture. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, Habakkuk 3, 6. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove us under the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. It's like the mountains go back to where they were before is, is just an idea. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan. That's down in South Egypt, west of the Red Sea. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. <laughs> you ever afflicted a tent? Nobody's ever like walked up to somebody while you're camping and be like, "Rar!" <laughs> That's afflicting a tent. If you, you go up and shake the tent, the tents of Kushan were afflicted too. And the cur and the curtains. I don't do that when I go camping. I take bears very seriously. Bears are bad news always. <laughs> Some people do that sort of thing. And the curtains 
of the land of Midian did tremble. So it uh, looks like curtains, again, being part of tents or at least part of buildings. That's south of Edom, east of the Red Sea. So that whole area on the whole map that you've ever seen for your Bible maps, the whole place is getting shook up. Verse 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? I already told you he dried up the rivers. Was thy wrath against the sea? God's shaking stuff up, tsunamis happening, maybe on earth, but I'm going to show you it's probably in heaven. Look at the rest of verse 8. That thou didst ride upon thine, what? Horses, Revelation 19. And thy chariots of salvation. You and I are coming back with the Lord on horses. There's no question where we're at on the time frame. We're right here at the second advent. I think that the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. Well, you can think whatever you want, but I don't know how we come back if we haven't got raptured up first at the same moment because the tribulation is not over yet. This is the very end of it. Thou didst ride upon the... Two, 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 where am I? 19, or 9, verse 9. Thy bow was made quite naked, used up all the arrows, according to the oaths of the tribes. I don't know what that is. God's oath to his 12 tribes, Genesis 49, 24, Joseph's bow. That's probably not very helpful. Even thy word, Silah, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers, split up the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by, and there's that phrase, the deep, uttered his voice, and lifted up his hands on high. 11, the sun and moon. See, you thought the deep was the oceans, but then he just started talking about the sun and moon. So is the deep on the earth or is the deep above the heavens? You decide. Verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went. At the shining of thy glittering spear, thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. A threshing machine is what tears up the, all the crops. A, a th What's a thresher? Sawyer, or a thrasher, whatever they call those things. Tears up all the plants that hold on to the crops. What? Okay. What's a thresher do? After it's out of the field? To me, if I was the prophet writing, it would look like... But in the old days, it's a machine separate from the field. Okay, so he's gathering all these people up, and then he's threshing them. Like he's just trampling them to death with blood flying everywhere, if this is people. Well, yeah, the threshing floor. Yeah, just getting beat up. Okay. Verse 13, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. I have like eight farm books there, but I can't understand them. I turn. <laughs> thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Remember when we started this whole thing off with the, his uh, Romans 16? Verse 14, thou didst strike through with his staves the heads of the villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Uh, if you study whirlwinds in the Bible, it's always second advent. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Uh, Judas Iscariot was talking about the poor. Shouldn't this have been sold for so many pence and given to the poor? He said not that because he cared for the poor, but because he held the bag. So the Antichrist does what Judas did here, and he makes a <clears throat> he makes a uh, false uh, implication that he's helping poor people but he's devouring the poor people secretly 15 thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters now maybe that's on the earth or maybe that's through here coming down here down through the earth down through the universe like the of great through the like surging of great waters so something's getting all stirred up. Heap of great water. Heap is what happened at the Red Sea. Remember the waters got heaped up on the left and on the right? 
When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones. Imagine Haggai seeing this. I mean, he's seeing this vision, and it's this consuming and making him sick. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Lord, am I going to be here for this? I hope I'm sleeping. When he cometh up into the people, he will invade them with his troops. That's you and me. We covered that. So the Lord comes back, and was thy wrath against the sea? Was thine anger against the rivers? The Lord comes back here, I believe, through this universe, lands on the earth, and starts shaking stuff up. And probably shaking, if the Red Sea is getting shaken in Egypt and south, southern Edom, the whole earth is probably getting traumatized. And then we're landed on the earth with all these as the troops with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it would make a lot of sense for us to come back that way because that's the same way we went up. I mean, when you go up, you're going up just like the Red Sea deliverance. When you got saved, the Lord put you through the Red Sea and washed away all your sins. But when you get raptured, you go through the thing again. And so the picture is that you get raptured and taken up through a big body of waters, and then you land up here safe on the other shore. And if, that, if that's the case, then the Lord will take care of you in that day, and you'll land safely on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Um, what's another verse that talks about? Um, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And there's probably 25 songs in your songbook that talk about you getting to the other side of some waters and standing on the other side safely after going through a troublous, tumultuous heap of waters that looks like the Lord's angry with. And I'll tell you, the Lord's angry with this thing here. This thing all started with judgment. There's nothing called good about this on day two in Genesis chapter one. There's a reason it's not called good. It's because it's part of the destruction right at the very beginning when the devil was um, getting judged. I'm thinking of too many things and we're 20 minutes over. So let's, let's finish up here take up some prayer requests and if you have any questions on that we can cover it with more references and more did anybody find these references are these right